The government has announced targeted payments to businesses struggling in the red traffic light, and it comes as the Prime Minister says the country will move out of the red after the peak. That's possibly six weeks away. So can businesses really be expected to survive until then? Joining us now is Deputy Prime Minister Grant Robertson. Good morning, Minister. Thanks for joining us. Uh, there's been uh, a lot going on outside of Parliament this morning. Did you have any trouble getting in? They've, we've seen scuffles, we've seen uh, police and riot gear. Uh, no, I didn't have any trouble getting in today. Um, obviously, I've seen those images, and some of them are pretty distressing too. I see that someone appears to have driven a car into the police as well. So, look, the police are out there doing their job, and I, I do want to say as the local MP here, the Wellington Central MP, how grateful I am to the frontline police for the work that they've been doing. Um, I know on behalf of Wellingtonians, they, they want this protest to end. It's, it's uh, disrupting their lives, businesses people going to school getting harassed and abused, um, excrement being poured down the drains here. Um, this is an illegal protest and I think Wellingtonians, whatever point uh, the protesters were trying to make, Wellingtonians want to see the protest end. I want to talk about the business support package that you announced yesterday and look at the eligibility. So. A business would have to prove they have a 40% drop over seven consecutive days prior to 15th of February. Now the period you're looking at is summer, basically when Auckland hospitality was already on its knees. So many that need the support aren't actually going to be able to access it. So it's really important that we, we explain what that is. That's called the comparative period. So it's looking at a week now and comparing it to a seven-day period in that in that period prior to the 15th of February. Uh, and in that period, you know, businesses were, were operating largely in the orange area, some in the red uh, across the country. Uh, we think that this um, period will give us an idea of the impact of this Omicron outbreak, of the way in which uh, the red settings have been operating. If you are a seasonal business, if you're a business Business that does operate very much on uh, on that kind of seasonal uh, uh, basis, then you can uh, apply to have a different comparative period. But it, when we try to set this, we usually use the six-week period beforehand. Um, if we tried to compare, say, to last year, um, firstly, Auckland was in alert level three during periods of that, but also we'd miss out on the 145,000 odd businesses that have been created in the last year. They wouldn't uh, be able to be eligible. So obviously, we'll take a look, and we do want to make sure it is those hospitality um, accommodation style businesses that get support. So if there are concerns about that, we'll have a look at it. But it is the process we've used for similar payments before. There are a number of hospitality businesses who are, who are obviously welcoming the support because any support they can get is good. But there is also confusion and anger from many who say that uh, over that summer period, one for instance who contacted me, over that Christmas period they had to pay wages, full wages for an unvaccinated staff member for 28 days because they couldn't come into work. They had to give them that money to allow them to go and have time to get uh, vaccinated because of the mandates. Of course, after receiving the full pay, the staffer didn't. So why wasn't the support given to hospitality businesses, especially in Auckland, back then? Well, actually, it was, Melissa. We put in place the transition support payment just before Christmas, which actually is based around the same numbers um, that you've seen in this payment. So, you know, we've had $23 billion worth of support over the last couple of years that's gone in to businesses and supporting workers. Recognise that this is very, very tough for a number of businesses. It's the reason why we've given the kind of support that we have. On that specific issue, um, employment law still needed to apply as we went through uh, the imposition of those those mandates. It's unfortunate to hear that that person didn't end up getting vaccinated and didn't stay in the workforce, uh, but we have to respect employment law as we go through these situations. But this support is here. Um, our estimate is that for a, a business of around 20 people, this would pay for about 60% of their fixed costs uh, over that six-week period. That's, that's a contribution from taxpayers, but we do recognise that it does put a lot of stress to the situation on business owners. Uh, let's look at the test to return rules that are in place at the moment under phase two and how they apply to businesses. So let's say I work in a cafe and I'm a close contact of somebody with COVID. I go to a testing station where you can now get the rapid antigen tests uh, if you are a close contact and I test negative. Can I go back and work at the cafe? 
Um, as long as you've got a, a, a negative test, I mean, if you're a close contact, you do have isolation requirements still, and, and that's important. So, what's um, the point the, of the what's the point of taking giving out those rapid antigen tests if those people still have to isolate anyway? because it allows people to be tested much more quickly and obviously with PCR testing we have the capability to process about 35,000 odd tests a day. But what's we the point of being, of being of processed quickly if they can't go back to work anyway? Well, it's important for people to know whether or not they have Omicron so that they themselves can isolate and let their contacts know. Um, the role of rapid antigen tests is going to evolve as we move into phase three of the situation. And a really important point, Melissa, is when we go into phase three, which won't be far away at all, the definition of close contacts changes. It narrows to be basically a household contact because we do recognise with more cases the level of disruption that businesses are going to face will be much higher. While we're in phase two at the moment, we are still asking people who are close contacts to get tested and to isolate. We still have a job to do here to make sure we manage the spread of this outbreak. So yes, it's disruptive for businesses. I do accept that. We will be seeing some changes in the, in the definition of close contact, which will help those businesses. But phase three is going to be more disruptive for businesses. So when will that come into effect? Because um, previous advice was that it, we could go into phase Phase three when there are thousands of cases a day, which we're at now. Yeah, look, and as I say, I don't think that will be far away at all. Um, we said around about 5,000 cases a day was where the trigger point for that would be. We know that cases are doubling every three or four days. I would just say that while phase three um, represents a period of time where there will be a lot of cases, as I said, because of the narrowing of the definition of close contacts during that, actually that will help businesses. It will mean that fewer people will be captured by the definition and therefore would be able to carry on working. Deputy Prime Minister Grant Robertson, really appreciate your time on the programme this morning. Thanks for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, Melissa.